commitment, passion, performance, countless hours of training. These are just a few of the things our dreams are made of. We are Cirque du Soleil artists and we all have a story to tell. Behind the scenes, behind the makeup and all the costumes, this is unfiltered, raw, like you've never seen before. Welcome to Cirque Stories. Hi, I'm Christina Jones, and I'm your host for Cirque Stories. In this episode, I met up with Miguel Vazquez, a world-renowned trapeze artist, current world record holder, and a legend in the circus community. Here's his story. Miguel, first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to share your story with us. It's a true honor for us to have you on Cirque Stories. Thank you, it's my pleasure, and uh, humbled that you chose me. <laughs> Your story is special for, for many reasons, um, and it's kind of hard to know where to start because you have so many parts to your story. But I think one of the coolest things is that you're the first person that we're highlighting that's a technician. You're a rigger. Yes, right? I am. I am a, I'm a rigger right now. That Michael Jackson won. But I was at O for eight years before that, so you know, uh, that's where I made the transition from performing to backstage. Right. And fascinating enough, we, we worked at the same show and I knew you as a rigger, but it was years before I knew what a big deal performer <laughs> you are as well. Yeah. So um, let's delve a little bit into that. Uh, okay. Where were you born? I was born in Mexico, okay. you know, outside Guadalajara, and um, was traveled with, uh, with the circus family. I come from five generation circus artists. My brothers were already in Europe doing a uh, bar act, and that's when uh, they decided to call me over when they were going to start doing a flying trapeze act. And was there ever a moment in your childhood when you thought, maybe I want to do something different? Well, not, not really. You know, I grew up in the circus, and uh, I remember the first time I went uh, in the ring, in the circus, we call it the ring, in front of the uh, audience, I was like six years old. Wow. And, you know, you, you just get this feeling, I want to do this. And, and n never really look back. Uh, when we started uh, making the transition and we started bu building our flying trapeze act, at the beginning it was a little bit difficult and uh, didn't enjoy it 100%, but it came a time when uh, I fell in love with it and it was my passion. Why don't you share with us the title that you hold? My brother and I were the first ones uh, to do a quadruple somersault on the flying trapeze, a feat that has never been done in the history of trapeze. Most of the great trapeze artists before I came along tried it and uh, tried it and tried it, and they decided that it was something that it was impossible. There was no way to be able to do it. And at the time I was 16 years old, I was full of energy, and you know, I, I said, I'm gonna give it a shot. And we practiced every day for about six months. You know, we used to practice every night after doing the performance. And finally, just before we were going to give up on the trick, we said, you know, I guess these guys were right. We can't do it. Uh, we decided to give ourselves like an extra week, and we caught it in that week. A feat unparalleled in circus history. A quadruple somersault to the hands of the catcher. Attempted by the first and only performer to have mastered this amazing feat, Miguel Vasquez. by Miguel and Juan Vasquez. The news spread all over the world. Because you accomplished the impossible. Yeah, what they say was impossible, uh, we made it possible. Well, 
It's estimated that at one point during the stunt, Vasquez's body was traveling 75 miles an hour, which of course is well over the speed limit. But then to give him a ticket, you'd have to catch him, and only his brother does that. What made you decide to transition from performing to rigging? When you uh, are in the circus, you learn how to fabricate your own rigging, set it up, take it down. You know, you put, uh, you put your life in it, so we always used to like to uh, be able to make sure we rig the, <laughs> the rigging where we're, our lives depend on. So you learn from a young age to also do rigging and fabrication and everything like that. So we already, I already knew how to do all the rigging work on it. At that time, I was already working uh, as a station here in, in Las Vegas, and then an opening came up for me to join O Cirque du Soleil as a, as a rigger in the rigging department. I just made that transition from performing from on stage to backstage. So it felt like the natural transition. Pretty much, and, and uh, for us, um, you still feel connected, you know, even though maybe you're not on stage anymore, but you're part of the show, you're part of the scene, you're part of uh, making it happen, making sure everything goes well and everything's safe. And, and I think the beauty of uh, being an ex-artist, you can relate to the artists on stage. We're not strangers. We know what they go through, we know what they feel. We know the struggles, we know the situations. I know what it is to get up in the morning and feel really bad. <laughs> I just wanna take a moment also to like thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us and to thank all riggers and all crew that are behind the scenes because if it's not for you guys, the show doesn't go on. Everybody just sees people on stage, but people don't know just how much goes into that. So thank you. Well, you're welcome and, and it is a massive task. You've seen backstage, you know, it takes a, a large amount of technicians to make it happen. Our job is to make sure you guys are safe and everything is it's, uh, in the right place at the right time and make the magic happen. And you know, we depend on each other, you know, artists and technicians. Without you, we have no show and without techs, we can't run the show. So. It's just a beautiful thing that we do together every night, I think. Agreed. And do you have any advice for current circus performers? I will say, enjoy what you're doing. Build memories, you know, go all out, stay humble. And you so perfectly <laughs> demonstrate that Thank your you. humility is inspiring. Thank you. If you had no health problems, no worries, all the money in the world, no responsibilities, what would you do? I think I would love to maybe build a facility uh, to continue teaching the circus arts to maybe the underprivileged kids and the youth, whatever has to do with circus and whatever has to do with the technical side to keep the magic going. Beautiful. Miguel is a legend and a hero in the circus world, but he remains humble, soft-spoken, and continues to give back to the trapeze community. He's an excellent reminder that there's an incredible crew behind every Cirque show that the audience doesn't see. As artists, we know that what we do wouldn't be possible without the exceptional expertise and guidance of people just like Miguel. Hi, I'm Christina Jones, and I'm your host for Cirque Stories. I'm a synchronized swimmer in Cirque du Soleil's production O at the Bellagio. My synchronized swimming career before I got to Cirque included competing in the 2008 Olympic Games and winning world championships with my duet partner Bill May. I really realized that I was done competing with synchronized swimming. I was done with such um, structure and I wanted to express myself as an artist and Cirque du Soleil was the perfect avenue for this. I got to explore a whole new side of my sport that I had never seen before. 
Competitive synchronized swimming is extremely regimented and precise, and after nearly 15 years of it, I needed to let my hair down. While some of that same precision is important at O, there's way more room for creativity, exploration, and artistic growth. A lot of my synchro idols had joined Cirque after their competitive careers, and I always knew I wanted to follow in their footsteps. In 2007, my Olympic team had a training camp in Vegas, and I finally got a chance to see O. That confirmed it, I knew that I wanted to perform on that stage one day. At first, I had a hard time adjusting to the nocturnal schedule of a circus performer, but then I realized we have virtually our entire day free. I decided to put myself through school and attend classes during the day while doing 10 shows a week at night. My story has been told time and time again. It's always sugar-coated. It just portrays this fake reality that everything is roses and sunshine all the time. And while the Olympics were fantastic, they were a huge highlight of my life, I feel that the true story hasn't really been told yet. The story behind the scenes, I want these stories to be real, unfiltered, and raw. As I started to look around backstage and talk to my friends with Cirque, I started to realize how incredible everyone's stories really are. I realized that this is what I need to be doing. I need to be sharing these stories with the world. We are Cirque performers, and every night we perform for you. We make you laugh, we make you cry, we entertain you. But behind the makeup and the costumes and all the masks and everything you see, each of us has an individual story to tell. We wanted to invite you behind the scenes, behind the curtain, to see what really goes on backstage, what really goes on in life before we show up at work to entertain you. Last year, my life threw a huge surprise at me. I thought I was done with competitive synchronized swimming, but it turns out I wasn't. Um, a new event called the Mixed Duet was added to the FINA World Championships, and a mixed duet is when a man and a woman swim together. A huge moment for the Americans in particular, <laughs> Bill May Brilliant. and Christina Jones. Up until last year, men were banned from elite competitions of synchronized swimming, and it turns out that I got paired with one of my very best friends, Bill May and we had a pretty incredible experience together and I decided to bring him here to help tell that story a little bit and I think that through talking with him you'll be able to see a little bit of who I am and how Bill and I work together. <laughs> Not only have I known Bill since I was 10, but now we get to perform together for Cirque. Everybody sees the fame and glory and just like the final moment of a lot of hard work when you watch sporting events, when you watch the Olympics, world championships, whatever it is. But they don't really see what goes on behind the scenes. And I just really wanted us to have a chance to share with people what it's like to prepare for such a huge event. That whole journey from start to finish, mm -hmm. you know, you have so many ups and downs that people don't see. And I think it is nice for people to see the hard work that goes into it and just how difficult it is to really go after, you know, you don't get breaks. You don't have time for your friends. You don't have time for your family. You don't have time to do your laundry. Yeah, you I think the I mean? sacrifice, the sacrifice is something that people just don't understand. Like yeah. you moved from New York to California just to train and you left your family when you were 16 mm -hmm. to do that. And I homeschooled the last couple of years of high school just because I was, I was leaving home at 4.30 in the morning, driving across the Bay Area to do weights and train and work out at Stanford University. Then I would go to high school, go do a full day of high school, and then I would train 3 to 9.30 p.m. and barely be able to get my homework done and then wake up at 4.30 again and do it all over. And my parents just realized it's, it's crazy. And you either have a chance to train for your Olympic dream mm -hmm. or you can have a normal teenage life, and I chose to go for it. Some people say, oh my gosh, synchronized swimming, that's amazing, but like, that's really one of my callings, I think. Like, I think people need to know the effort that we put in and how mm -hmm. difficult what we do really is, because when you compare our training to other sports, mm -hmm. it's insane. Well, you know, I think in that aspect, I think if there's somehow that we can use that as a challenge, you know, when people don't know the sport or they don't understand the sport, mm -hmm. to somehow kind of, you know, make them realize or express to them or invite them t into our world, yeah. I think that could be something that we could really use to showcase synchronized swimming as more of an athletic sport and just 
um, get a little bit more respect yeah. from people because yeah. I think people do say, you know, like it's floating in the water, it's not mm -hmm. this. And I think that just comes from one, not getting enough media for yeah. the sport. And yeah. two, just people, they've never tried it. You know, and we would train, when we were training, we could train up to 10 hours a day and not even blink. 10 hours you know, in the water yeah. without touching you know, like the side of the pool. You're not touching the side, you're not touching the yeah. bottom. Yeah. You're using every piece of energy in yeah. your body to hold yourself up. People really don't understand the difficulty that the sport entails. And I even get surprised. Like, I retired from synchronized swimming in 2008, retired again in 2010, <laughs> and as we know, I have... <laughs> <laughs> retired again in again 2015. last year. <laughs> and I know how hard it is. I mm. know how much goes into this sport, and even I couldn't believe how much it hurt physically <laughs> last year. Like, it hurts mm. so bad. Well, I think again, you know, you're using <laughs> your entire body to yeah. hold yourself up. You know, so there's not one part of your body that can, you can ever rest. Yeah. You know, like you're always engaged. Yeah. So, and people don't understand that. You know, just have anyone go try to tread water in a pool. For and don't two breathe. You're yeah. oxygen deprived exactly. too. Now take the breath away. And people, they, they can't even ask them to do their own sport and just not breathe. Yeah. You know, and they're going to get a little glimpse of what it is to be a synchronized swimmer and now take away their ability to stand on something. Yeah. And you're supposed to not show people that this is hurting. Well, maybe um, that little cut I gave you at Worlds helped people know how hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, when you jab my eye out. <laughs> <laughs> he dove in first last year and then I dove in after him and I like sliced his eye. Mm. Like my hand went like that. And you he know, was bleeding. And that's the other thing about something I'm assuming <laughs> is that when you're coming at me full speed, yeah. you know, it's like a car coming at you, but it's Thanks. behind a blur. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a tank just <laughs> running down like an army. <laughs> For both of us, I think it's safe to say that the moment that we won in Kazan was a pretty amazing moment. Oh, yeah. And we don't really ever talk about it the two of us because we both just kind of know well i mean i think even now goosebumps yeah <laughs> because it's it was the first time that something like happened so it was like this whole like mound of energy just came together because we had both had so much support and mm -hmm. you know it took an army for this to happen because we were working full time training full time mm -hmm. you know and going against the odds of people that have been swimming you know, constantly for the past 10 years, where yeah. we had not swum for 10 years. You know, so to um, be part of such a historical event, as well as pay off of all of the hard work that we have done, that other people have done with us, you know, that a whole accumulation of support just kind of was the top off by winning that gold medal. You know, yeah. we're swimming from our heart. And yeah. it's, that's all that we could ask for. You yeah. know, and it paid off. Yeah. So we walked away as the first world champions of, you know, in the mixed duet event. Yeah. <laughs> I remember asking you, like, did we, did we just win? Is that? <laughs> you're like, yeah. Like, I couldn't even really uh -huh. believe it. And I think a really special moment was looking over and seeing our coach, Chris Carver, and our yeah. other teammate, Christina Lum Underwood. It was like, it looked like mm. they had been just like crying forever. Like yeah. they had tears down their face. You know, Chris is coach and coach and coach, but this is something that she created. We both desperately want everything to be so incredibly perfect. Mm -hmm. Like we both think that we're a hundred percent right. <laughs> All of the time. And like, <laughs> it just took you a while to learn that like, I'm always right, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it took you a while to learn that, oh, <laughs> that I'm stubborn. <laughs> we did have those moments where we would kind of, you know, mm. clash because we both wanted the same thing, mm -hmm. but it wasn't always just sunshine and roses and laughter. It, I mean, it was, there were some really, really challenging days, really hard days. Yeah. But I think, you know, that's what happens when two people love each other so much is that, you know, the high points are even higher and the mm -hmm. low points are lower. Yeah. And it's because sure. you do care so much about each other and we cared so much about our goal that, you know, of course, mm -hmm that fighting was going to happen and it was only going to make us stronger. Yeah. And I think, you know, in fighting with each other, it brought that fight that we would show the world as a force, as one. All right, let's do it. If you had no worries, all the money in the world, no bills to pay, um, no health concerns, no responsibilities, no problems, what would you do? I think I'm drawn to people that are the underdogs, mm -hmm. you know, because that's something in my life that I've had to deal with. Mm -hmm. So I think something that I could give to a child and make them realize that no matter how, they ha how hard or difficult they have it, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. you know, there's always a smile and there's always something that's gonna be better from them. I think that I would travel. I love traveling. I just got back from Cuba. It was an amazing experience. I backpacked throughout Southeast Asia after the Olympics. I love seeing people all over the world. I would try to just share people's stories for who they are, not for who society thinks that they should be or what people think of who they are or what they stand for or what they believe in or what they look like. I would just want to share the stories of people all around the world for who they are. Awesome.